Hello. It is a big day, a significant day for all of us at the Atlantic Council and for our friends at the German Marshall Fund. Uh, it is a great pleasure to host the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg for his reflections on the Alliance's future. I'm Fred Kemp. I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and I'm here with my colleague, Karen Donfrey. Welcome to this very special edition of the Atlantic Council's front page, the premier live ideas platform for global leaders. We've been hearing from extraordinary leaders on this platform, including the IMF's Managing Director, Kristalina Georgieva, the Colombian President, Ivan Duque, and later this week, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani. Uh, we are delighted to be partnering with our colleagues at the German Marshall Fund of the United States and with NATO Public Diplomacy to bring you a conversation with the Secretary General of NATO for the launch of the Alliance's reflection process, evaluating how to strengthen NATO in an increasingly competitive world. Uh, we're having this conversation as the world confer confronts uh, the worst pandemic in a century and the deepest economic downturn since the Great Depression. And here in the United States, we're also facing uh, the, uh, the most widespread uh, anti-racist uh, protests in 50 years. Uh, we at the Atlantic Council are responding by doubling down on our founding purpose to advance a more equal, just, prosperous, and collaborative international order. And of course, the NATO Alliance has always been at the center of our work and the center of that purpose. Uh, thank you for joining us today from all around the world uh, for this important discussion. I encourage you to join in the conversation either by using the Q&A function, so at the bottom of your screen on Zoom, the Q&A function, or by tweeting your questions using the hashtag NATO 2030, hashtag NATO 2030. What you'll learn through this process is we may be geographically distant, but I think we're socially close around the NATO alliance. Now I'd like to turn to my friend and colleague, Karen Donfrey, president of the German Marshall Fund to introduce our speaker. Thanks so much, Fred. It is always a delight to cooperate with the Atlantic Council and with NATO. It is wonderful to have this opportunity to discuss NATO's reflection process with Secretary General Stoltenberg at a time when the Alliance is facing a wide array of challenges from Russia and China to cyber attacks, climate change, and a pandemic. What are the changes we need to make today to ensure that NATO will be relevant and effective over the coming decade and in 2030? To answer these questions, we will begin with framing remarks from NATO Secretary General. Then my wonderful colleague in Brussels, Nadia Kovalchikova, who works with GMF's Alliance for Securing Democracy, will moderate a conversation with the Secretary General. She will start with Fred and me and then take questions from you. Fred will then close us out. Now a word about Jens Stoltenberg the Secretary General of NATO. At a time when citizens in NATO countries are looking for leadership, they need look no further than NATO headquarters, where Secretary General Stoltenberg is providing strong, principled, and decisive leadership. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome Jens Stoltenberg, NATO's Secretary General, to the stage Mr. Secretary General, over to you. Good afternoon from uh, Brussels uh, and uh, good morning uh, to Karen and Fred in Washington and uh, welcome to all uh, who are following us uh, online. Last December, NATO leaders asked me uh, to make our strong alliance even stronger by making sure uh, we are as effective politically as we are militarily, and that we remain ready today uh, to tackle the challenges of tomorrow. This is an opportunity to reflect on where we see our alliance 10 years from now, and how it will continue to keep us safe in a more uncertain world. So today I am happy to launch my reflection on NATO 2030. COVID-19 
has changed our lives in ways we could barely imagine. And it has magnified existing trends and tensions when it comes to our security. Russia continues, continues its military activities unabated. ISIL and other terrorist groups are emboldened. Both state and non-state actors uh, promote disinformation and propaganda. And the rise of China is fundamentally shifting the global balance of power, heating up uh, the race for economic and technological supremacy, multiplying the threats to open societies and individual freedoms, and increasing the competition over our values uh, and our way of life. NATO 2030 is about how we adapt this new normal. And to do this, we must stay strong militarily, be more united politically, and take a broader approach globally. So first, we need a strong military alliance to protect our democracies and to continue to compete in a more competitive world. Threats to our security have not gone away while we are focusing on the pandemic, just the opposite. As we look to 2030, we must continue to invest in our armed forces and modern military capabilities. They have kept us safe for over 70 years as they continue to do today. Security is the foundation for our prosperity now and in the future. <clears throat> but military strength is only part of the answer. We also need to use NATO more politically. This means bringing all the issues that affect our security to NATO's table, so that we can forge stronger consensus sooner and more systematically. From conflicts in the wider Middle East region to global arms control and the security consequences, of climate change. Using NATO more politically also means using a broader range of tools, military and non-military, economic and diplomatic. This is especially important as we work together to strengthen the resilience of our societies and our economies, and to ensure that we do not import vulnerabilities into our critical infrastructure, industries, and supply chains. NATO may not always be on the front line to act, but it must always be the forum for frank discussion and genuine consultation. In fact, NATO is the only place that brings Europe and North America together every day. We have the structures and the institutions in place. What we need is the political will to use NATO, to decide, and when necessary, to act for our shared security. Finally, in a world of great global competition, where we see China coming closer to us from the Arctic to cyberspace, NATO needs a more global approach. This is not about a global presence, but about a global approach. NATO brings together 30 allies on both sides of the Atlantic. Almost 1 billion people, half of the world's military and economic might, and a network of global partners. As we look to 2030, we need to work even more closely with like-minded countries like Australia, Japan, New Zealand, South Korea, to defend the global rules and institutions that have kept us safe for decades, to set norms and standards in space and in cyberspace on new technologies and global arms control, and ultimately to stand up for a world built on freedom and democracy, not on bullying and coercion. The challenges that we face over the next decade are greater than any of us can tackle alone. Neither Europe alone, nor America alone. So we must resist 
the temptation of national solutions. And we must live up to our values, freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. These values are what define us. They are what make us strong as nations and as an alliance. As we continue to compete in a more competitive world, we must keep our democracies strong. My vision for NATO 2030 is not about reinventing NATO. It is about making our strong alliance even stronger. Strong militarily, stronger politically, and more global. To help us get there, I have asked a group of experts to provide new ideas. I will continue to consult actively with allies and I will reach out to civil society, the private sector and young leaders, as we are doing here today. My recommendations will inform the direction NATO leaders set out when we meet next year. Together, we can look to NATO 2030 with confidence. Together, we will keep our people safe in a more uncertain world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General, for your insightful remarks and for sharing with us your vision and reflection for NATO 2030. It is my great pleasure to be leading the conversation with you today. And now we will turn back to Washington, D.C. for the first two questions. Karen, the floor is yours. Thanks, Nadia. And Mr. Secretary General, what a terrific set of framing remarks. And you mentioned that your goal in this reflection process is not about reinventing NATO, but about making NATO stronger and more global. And I want to draw you out on what that means in terms of NATO's relationship with China. We've seen a stark deterioration, certainly in the US-China relationship. From where you sit in Brussels, does NATO see China as the new enemy? Thank you. No, NATO does not uh, see China as the new enemy or an adversary. But what we see is that the rise of China is fundamentally changing the global balance of power. And uh, the uh, NATO leaders, uh, heads of state and government, when they met in uh, London in December, they, for the first time in NATO's history, agreed that NATO has to address the consequences, uh, the security consequences of the rise of China. There are some opportunities because the economic growth of China has fueled economic growth in our part of the world, and it has helped to lift uh, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But at the same time, we see that the fact that China soon will have the biggest economy in the world, they will have, uh, they already have the, uh, uh, the second largest defense budget. They are investing heavily in modern military capabilities, including missiles that can reach uh, all NATO allied countries. Uh, they are coming closer to us in cyberspace. We see them in the Arctic, in Africa. We see them investing in our critical infrastructure. Uh, and they're working more and more together with Russia. All of this has a security uh, uh, consequence for NATO allies. And therefore, we need to be able to respond to that, to, to address that. And we need to do that by forging NATO as a stronger political alliance. We need to do that by working together with uh, partners, not least, not least in the Asia Pacific, including uh, uh, Australia, Japan, South Korea, New Zealand, uh, which are very close and like-minded partners to, uh, to NATO. So this was an... Uh, a message coming from the leaders last December, and now we are following up on that uh, when we now address NATO 2030 and the reflection process. Very important points. And I would like to turn to the second question uh, coming from DC. Fred, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, strong po militarily, stronger politically, and more global. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, that's such an important message and uh, this reflection process is historically significant, so thank you for this. Uh, one question on this, as a, as a follower of NATO for many years, you seem to be pointing a little bit to people what people call Article 2. And uh, one language, one of the pieces of language in it says, they will seek to eliminate conflict in their international economic policies 
and will encourage economic collaboration between any or all of them. Most people don't know that's in the NATO charter. So my question running off of this is how important is this? And you didn't explicitly mention the European Union in your vision for the future of NATO, but this new uh, direction would suggest a closer collaboration with the European Union. So NATO is a military and political alliance, and, and you are right that sometimes I feel that uh, we all forget in, in a way the importance of the political dimension of NATO. Uh, of course, NATO is about protecting each other, it's about Article 5 and collective defense, but it's also about working together in a political alliance, addressing, uh, for instance, the importance of resilience. That's actually Article uh, 3, so there are many relevant articles. Uh, uh, so both Article 2 and Article 3 is about, in a way, non-military means of securing our security, of maintaining peace. Uh, and I think that COVID-19 has demonstrated clearly the importance of uh, uh, addressing also non-military challenges and threats and the role uh, NATO can play in helping the civilian society in dealing with that. When it comes to the uh, European Union and Europe, <clears throat> I strongly believe in uh, cooperation between the European Union and NATO. And I very much welcome the fact that we have been able to lift the cooperation between NATO and the European Union to unprecedented levels. We need to continue to do that. And I also believe that, um, that uh, I also welcome uh, the EU efforts on defense. Uh, but, I, but at the same time, EU cannot replace NATO. Uh, we have to remember that um, uh, almost 60% of the people living in NATO, in a NATO country, they live in a non-EU uh, state. 80% uh, of NATO's defense expenditure uh, is coming from non-EU members, and we have to be able to protect 100% of our people. Uh, so there is no way uh, uh, EU can replace NATO, but as long as we work together in a good way, we can complement each other. Talking about complementing each other, I am uh, very pleased to receiving questions from also our viewers on social media. Uh, first question I would like to raise with you is from Jade Cave, a 16-year-old from the Krems editorial team. We received her question over email. And talking about the future of NATO, we also speak about future of all the citizens and the young generations. And her question relates to that. Where do young people fit into NATO, both now and in the future? I think the, the most fundamental answer to that question is that peace matters, uh, especially for young people, because it's only by providing peace and freedom, which is the core responsibility of NATO, that young people can decide themselves what kind of life they would like to live. Uh, job, education, uh, but also to address all the other important issues uh, uh, we are faced with, like climate change or now uh, the fight against racism. Without peace, we will fail uh, in all those uh, efforts. Uh, so peace and freedom is so fundamental for everything else we do. And and I, uh, I'm not young, but I've, even even I take peace in one way for granted because peace have been the way the normal in Europe for NATO allied countries in North America and Europe uh, since we established a NATO for more than 70 years. But peace has not been the normal uh, thing in, in Europe. Actually, in Europe, uh, NATO allies were ravaged by war for centuries. So uh, uh, the most important thing for young people is to make sure that they can take peace uh, as granted as I've been able to take. And the only way to ma make sure that that happens is that we continue to have uh, NATO as a strong alliance, uh, uh, preserving peace and uh, freedom. Thank you very much. The second question I would like to raise with you is from Terry Schultz, a journalist from Deutsche Welle and NPR, who also shared her question over email. Considering the current events and developments, uh, what's happening uh, with the troops uh, in Germany, her question is, how do you comment on US media reports that the US is planning to withdraw almost 10,000 troops from Germany? So I can never comment on media leakages and media speculation. Uh, 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 but what I can say is that we are constantly uh, uh, consulting with the United States, uh, with other uh, NATO allies on uh, the military posture uh, presence in, uh, in uh, Europe. Of course, after the end of the Cold War, we saw the US gradually reducing its uh, military presence in Europe. 
over the last few years, we've actually seen an uh, increase in the US presence uh, in Europe again. Uh, uh, and this is not only about Germany, but we have seen, for instance, uh, uh, a new uh, US brigade deployed to Europe. We have seen more rotational presence. Uh, we have seen US taking a lead uh, or the lead function in the uh, a NATO battle group in Poland, uh, more rotational military presence of US forces in the Baltic countries, in Romania, uh, including with, um, with a base for uh, missile defense. And of course, we also seen uh, naval presence in the Spanish Rota base in Spain. Uh, and even in my own country, Norway, we see now more US uh, presence. So over the last years, we've actually seen more US presence, including in uh, uh, investing in pre-positioned equipment, more exercises. Naval presence, uh, the first time we had a US aircraft carrier now uh, during the Trident Juncture exercise. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we had significant US uh, naval presence in the North, we've seen in the Black Sea, in the Mediterranean, and so on. So, so, so the thing is that European allies and the United States, we are doing more together now in Europe than we've done for many, many years. I think that reflects the, the fact that we have actually been able to strengthen the military cooperation within NATO over the last years. Thank you very much. Now we will have uh, we will give an opportunity to two of our viewers to ask a question directly over, over Zoom. The first question you will hear will be from Victoria Bucataro. Over to you. Yes, hello uh, to everyone. And I I'm very delighted to participate in this event uh, with uh, Mr. Stoltenberg. Uh, and thank you very much for, um, for your remarks, uh, which I find very important. And one of them is that uh, we really have to take care of peace and we shouldn't take it for granted. I think that this is one of the most important things. But I will get back um, to question and uh, I'm uh, here representing or being an alumni of the GMF Marshall Memorial Fellowship Program. And um, this question is also coming, me being in the Republic of Moldova, and this is a great opportunity. Uh, so first of all, we have to acknowledge that the spontaneous global crisis provoked by COVID-19 pandemics has enforced a trend which was gaining more and more ground, that is uh, national versus collective. As a result, uh, how do you see the security architecture developing in a way that it meets the individual and collective needs of the countries, both members uh, of NATO, of the alliance, but also partners? And how do we keep in these circumstances our collective values alive as they are still seen as one of the main premises for peace? Thank you. Well, I strongly believe that in uncertain times, uh, we need strong multilateral institutions. And NATO is one of the biggest, most important international institutions we have established. Uh, uh, we, we saw the, 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 uh, the NATO emerge out of uh, the Second World War uh, uh, and was, uh, the whole institution was established to prevent uh, war from ever again uh, uh, so, uh, affecting the people in NATO allied uh, countries. Um, and, and I strongly believe that if there's anything uh, we uh, could learn uh, uh, from the crisis and the, the decades that has passed since NATO was established is that when we are faced with uncertainty, then we need uh, strong international institutions. So I think this is the time to strengthen multilateral institutions, to strengthen multilateral uh, cooperation, and including to strengthen NATO. And that's exactly why we have launched NATO 2030, the reflection process to make sure that we change, that we adapt as the world is, is, uh, is changing. And again, since we see that the global balance of power is shifting, we see the rise of China and uh, compared to China, even the United States is not the biggest one. Uh, soon China will have the biggest economy in the world. Uh, they are leading in, in investing in a lot of uh, advanced technologies, into, including parts of inter artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and so on, then it's even more important that we stand together, uh, North America and uh, Europe uh, together, uh, because we cannot manage this alone. We need to do this together. So uh, my main message is that uh, when uh, things are difficult, then it's even more important that we stand together and that we do that North America and Europe together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before we come back to social media questions, we have the second question over Zoom again from Rachel Alejos. Over to you, Rachel. 
Yes, hello, uh, Secretary General, and thank you so much for your leadership in these very turbulent times. You already mentioned that NATO is increasingly expected to deal with non-military challenges like disinformation, cyber, energy, and climate, and that NATO doesn't necessarily hold all the tools. In addition to the partnerships that NATO has with other countries, for example, in the NATO in the Asia Pacific, how can NATO update and possibly expand its partnerships network to make sure it has the right partners to tackle these challenges? So I'm thinking along the lines of private sector partners, other international organizations. How can it expand that network? Thank you. Well, the strength of NATO is that uh, not only do we represent 30 members, uh, close to 1 billion people, half of the world's military might and economic might uh, through uh, the 30 members of NATO, but we are also working with uh, uh, 40 different partners around the world and we're working with other international institutions like the European Union. We have been able to strengthen that uh, with the UN and, uh, and, and, and again, since we'll have in a world which is constantly changing and we are faced with many different threats and challenges at the same time, the importance of working together with partners uh, has become even more uh, uh, critical for NATO. And that's the reason why we are focusing on that. And again, uh, one of the uh, purposes of, of NATO 2030 uh, is to look into how we can further strengthen uh, partnerships uh, in many uh, directions. Uh, addressing uh, not least uh, different non-military threats. We have seen, you know, cyber, we have seen uh, disinformation propaganda, as you mentioned. And I strongly believe that the best answer to propaganda is not propaganda. Uh, I believe that uh, the truth will prevail. Uh, and uh, and the facts, the truth is the best way to counter propaganda disinformation. The aim, of course, of propaganda and disinformation campaigns, as we have seen, for instance, connected to COVID-19, is to undermine trust in our democratic institutions, is to divide allies and, and, and reduce our ability to work together. What I believe is that the best way to counter propaganda and disinformation uh, that are to provide facts, the truth. And the best way to do that is to have a free and independent press. Uh, journalists asking the difficult questions, uh, checking their facts, checking their stories. That's the best way to make sure that uh, propaganda and disinformation doesn't uh, uh, succeed. I'd like to follow up on this question of propaganda or disinformation uh, during the crisis that we are all facing now, the global health crisis. Have you seen an increase of disinformation or propaganda that was targeting NATO or specifically trying to undermine NATO? Well, we have seen several examples where uh, uh, stories, uh, uh, propaganda, disinformation has been used to try to divide us, to undermine trust in NATO allied countries. Uh, we have seen both from Russia and China attempts to in a way blame NATO allies uh, for the existence of the uh, corona uh, virus. Uh, and we have seen stories that, uh, uh, that uh, we are not uh, able to support and help each other. The reality is that actually NATO allies are helping each other a lot. Uh, all allies are affected, but not all allies uh, in the same way at the same time. So we have seen, uh, we have seen uh, in Sarkar, our supreme uh, commander here in Europe, coordinating a lot of efforts of military. We have seen how military has been essential in transporting a lot of equipment, uh, medical evacuation, also transporting patients, uh, medical personnel, uh, setting up field hospitals, uh, thousands of beds, uh, uh, helping to control borders. So the military uh, supported by NATO has been key in uh, making sure that NATO allies are helping each other and also uh, partners. So, so again, the reality is that we need facts, we need the truth. That's the best way to counter disinformation also when it comes to COVID-19. And have a proactive communication of those facts. Absolutely, uh, uh, and therefore I try to do that. Uh, a lot of excellent people in NATO uh, working with communications, messaging every day, and they do an uh, excellent job. Uh, uh, I know that different, in different capitals, uh, NATO allies are uh, doing what they can to uh, proactively counter this information, uh, which is dangerous because it can really undermine trust in our democratic institutions. Uh, but again, I strongly believe that uh, the idea of free and open societies, uh, freedom of expression, uh, we need free and independent press. Those institutions are important uh, because in the long run, that's the best way to make sure that people have reliable sources of information and that any attempt to, to spread this information uh, 
uh, false stories are 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 uh, uh, not successful. Very good. Uh, I would like to go back now to our questions on social media. We received a question over Twitter from Iqbal Yousafzai on Afghanistan. So NATO's perhaps longest and the most challenging mission has been in Afghanistan, has been transforming. On 1st of June, uh, we welcomed the new NATO senior civilian representative in Afghanistan. So his question relates to that and is asking how will the NATO 2030 process, the future of NATO, affect Afghanistan security and stability and perhaps wider Asia stability uh, in the next decade? Of course, it's a bit too early for me to predict the exact outcome of the process in NATO 2030 because we are now launching it, we are starting it. But I believe uh, strongly that uh, we will have more focus on NATO as a training alliance, how NATO can uh, train, uh, build local capacity, enable countries themselves to stabilize their own countries. Because I think the lesson learned from Afghanistan, Iraq and elsewhere is that, of course, NATO has to be able to intervene to, 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 to deploy a large number of combat troops in big combat operations. But in the long run, uh, the best weapon we have uh, to fight terrorism and to stabilize countries is to enable countries to stabilize their own countries and to fight terrorism themselves. And that's exactly what we do in Afghanistan. We have been there for almost 20 years. Uh, but I think that what we have done over the last years has been to focus on enabling the Afghans to fight terrorism themselves, uh, to, uh, to stabilize their own country. And uh, there are many problems, uh, many reasons to be concerned about the situation in Afghanistan, but there is a huge achievement that we now have a strong Afghan security force, uh, which is able to fight terrorism themselves. And we welcome the agreement between the United States and Taliban. Uh, uh, because that is the first very important step towards uh, lasting peace in Afghanistan. And lasting peace in Afghanistan, we can only have if there's inter-Afghan negotiations, the Afghan-owned, Afghan-led process, and, and we support that. And I believe that the best way we can do that is to continue to train and help the Afghan security forces so they can uh, create peace and stability in their own country themselves. Thank you very much. Uh, and talking about the peace and stability in the future, where we are also facing uh, new threats or advanced uh, or new challenges we are, might not be even aware of coming from cyber or the use of technology in different ways. We have a question that came over email from Vel Velizar Shalamano. And uh, now, considering the fact we are 10 years since the adoption of the strategic concept, and we are looking into the next 10 years and hopefully beyond as well. Uh, his question, is it time for a new strategic concept for, of NATO to address cyber, space and hybrid threats with the potential disruptive role of technology on the 2030 horizon? Do we need and should we have a new strategic concept? So first of all, again, uh, I think it's a bit too early to say whether the uh, uh, process NATO 2030 will uh, lead to a, a new strategic concept for uh, NATO. For me, the most important thing is that we continue to change and adapt. Uh, one of the main reasons why NATO is the most successful alliance in history is that we have been able to change every time the world has changed. And we need to continue to change because the world continues to change. And, and the aim of uh, NATO 2030 is to make sure that happens. And I think that we have seen that in the, in, the ex in the strategic concept NATO has today, we have identified three core tasks. Tasks, collective defense, crisis management, including fighting terrorism, and, uh, and cooperative security as are working with the partners all, all around the world. This strategic concept was agreed in, back in 2010. That was before Crimea, before ISIL, uh, uh, Iran, Iraq, uh, Syria, and all the challenges we've faced since then. Um, the reality is that NATO has been able to implement the biggest adaptation of our alliance uh, sin in decades, since the end of the Cold War, with uh, high readiness forces, new battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance, uh, with a new cyber command, uh, declaring space as an operational domain, reforming our command structure, investing more uh, in defense. So we have really undertaken huge changes uh, of NATO with the same strategic concept. So for me, the most important thing is not whether we have a new strategic concept or not. The most important thing is that we are able to change NATO uh, as the world is changing. 
and adapting to the crisis like we are also facing today, the global health crisis. And as you mentioned, uh, there are a lot of non-military threats that we are already facing and probably will be facing also in the future. And that NATO has been adapting to this, to facing and encountering these threats. And also the question from um, another viewer, Ushua Wojtaszczyk uh, over Twitter came in the context of the coronavirus. And she's asking if civil emergency planning will continue to be prioritized or expanded in the NATO 2030, let's say in the next year's perspective. So we are all in the process of uh, working more on uh, resilience of, uh, uh, of our societies. Uh, we have something NATO call, uh, we call uh, the baseline requirements for uh, uh, civil uh, uh, resilience of our societies. And that includes the ability of any society or all our member states to deal with mass casualties. Um, uh, and, and we have seen the value of that uh, during the uh, uh, corona uh, pandemic. But we're also seeing that there are some lessons we all have to learn. We need to really look seriously into, for instance, do we have uh, the systems in place to have the uh, necessary equipment in right time at the right uh, uh, place uh, at the right time? Uh, uh, for instance, protective equipment. So we will now um, uh, we are now looking into how to update these requirements. We are working on a plan in NATO, both to address uh, a potential second uh, wave of the corona virus or the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and a more long-term plan to cope with pandemics more in general. Uh, so again, it underlines that resilience, uh, be it infrastructure, telecommunications, 5G, or healthcare, uh, uh, access to, to, to protective equipment, all of that matters for the civilian society, but it actually also matters for NATO as a military alliance and our military capabilities. And we have to support and work together, as we actually have done uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, we have seen significant military support to the civil efforts uh, coping with or dealing with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And while we are dealing with this uh, and using the civilian efforts to cope with pandemics, another question is about adversaries also beyond the pandemic that might be potentially causing uh, more even let's say existential issues to the alliance from Anna Welsh via Twitter. She's asking, how do you envisage NATO's relationship with Russia? over the next 10 years? Well, NATO's relationship with Russia is based on what we call a dual track approach. Uh, we have seen a more assertive Russia. We have seen a Russia being willing to use military force against neighbors in Georgia and Ukraine, uh, investing heavily in new modern capabilities, including uh, new uh, nuclear capabilities. They are deploying now a new missile called uh, SSC-8 uh, uh, missile, which has uh, which can reach uh, European cities, uh, reduces the threshold for potential use of nuclear weapons in an armed conflict, and, and, is, and, and led to the demise of the INF Treaty, a treaty that banned all intermediate range uh, weapons. Uh, and, and so they are heavily modernizing uh, uh, their uh, nuclear arsenals and, 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 and also adjusted their uh, doctrines. So we we have responded to this, not by mirroring what Russia is doing, but by making sure that we have credible deterrence and defense, because that's the best way to prevent the conflict, is to uh, remove any room for doubt, uh, any room for miscalculation about NATO's readiness, willingness to protect all allies. And as long as we provide that deterrence, there will be no conflict, no uh, 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 attack. So that's one part, what we call deterrence and defense. Uh, and make sure that we continue to provide that. At the same time, Russia is our neighbor. Russia is there to stay. Russia will not go away. And, 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 and we believe in dialogue with Russia. We will strive for a better relationship with Russia. Uh, we strongly believe in arms control. Uh, a new arms race will be dangerous and very costly. And therefore, we, we continue to work hard for arms control with Russia. Um, and, uh, and that's part of what we call the dual track, the dialogue approach to Russia. And I can just say myself, as a former Norwegian uh, politician, prime minister for 10 years, is that I know that it's possible to talk to the Russians and to actually make agreements with them. We did that, Norway, Russia, for many, many years uh, on, on military issues, on energy, on, on, on border issues, on many other issues, environment, fisheries. And, 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 and that was not despite of NATO, but it was, it was because of NATO. Uh, NATO provided a platform for us to work with Russia. 
And on this note of the importance of the cooperation and the dialogue, it was a great pleasure for me to lead the conversation with you. We have to wrap up. We have more questions coming in. Unfortunately, we do not have more time today, hopefully in the future, maybe in 10 years, if not sooner. And I would like to turn back uh, to Washington DC for concluding remarks. Uh, so back to Fred, over to you, Fred. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, uh, I don't know what the global virtual equivalent is to a standing room only audience, but we've had it here today. And, uh, and there are still a uh, hundred questions out there or more. Um, we hope to have you back uh, soon again. Uh, on behalf of Karen Donfried and uh, everyone at GMF and uh, everyone at the Atlantic Council, thank you for these really important reflections. Uh, we look forward to working with you on deepening the political dimension, on the global dimension, and of course, on the related China dimension. Um, we, uh, uh, for our guests, thank you for joining us today. We hope that you can join us Thursday, uh, June 11th, this Thursday, at 10 a.m. Washington, 4 p.m. Brussels, 6.30 p.m. Kabul for President Ashraf Ghani, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and have a good week. And tell them, Mr. Secretary General, uh, thank you again for these really important comments to make an institution stronger that needs to be strong during these times. Thank you.